Shall we bow our hearts? Precious Holy Spirit, we worship you. We welcome you. Lord, we honor you. We glorify you. We adore you. We love you. Father, you are, oh Lord, our everything. And everything we need is in you. You are the one we desire. You are our portion. You are our joy. You are our strength. Your word is eternal. Your word is life. Your word is everlasting. Your word is light. Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Deliver us from our old ways of thinking, from the old man. Deliver us, O oh Lord. Help us to receive, O oh Lord. Set us free, O oh Lord, by your word. In the name that is above every name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 So, um, we started looking at this new series. Last week, Pastor Sam had um, NLT engraved on her forehead, and I don't want it, so I'm just going to stay on this side. Is that okay? Am I good on this side? Okay. Um, so we're looking at this new series, and Who Are You is the series. And um, we've looked at that you are a chosen person. You are chosen. Um, you are a saint, no longer a sinner. Um, and we looked at it in... Um, the construct of culture and, and the construct of community because it's very important that we understand what our identity is. If you look at what is happening out there in the world today, and not only out there, but in here as well, the whole problem that everything stems from the fact is that we've lost our identity, okay? And so it's really, really important to know who we are and to know it from the person in the word by the one who created you. Not by the world standard, not by because of what your mother or father said you were, not by what your school teacher said you were, not by what your neighborhood always said you were, not by your school principal who labeled you, not by any of those things, but by the one who defines you and defines your identity. So we looked last week, and it was a really powerful word. If you missed last week, I'd really like you to go and look up saint. That's what we looked at la last week. Pastor Sam elaborated on it, and it was a magnificent, powerful word. The presence of the Lord was so powerful. And I pray, you see, there is nothing we can re receive from a speaker. It is only the Holy Spirit that can bring conviction. So I pray that the Holy Spirit does something amazing in your hearts this morning because it is a powerful, powerful scripture passage. Okay? Go with me, and if you're taking notes, I would really like you to take notes. If you're going to put it in your phones or if you have pens, if you go analog like me, you have your pens. Um, bank on Romans 6. That's where, where, we, where we're going. Um, before we go to Romans 6... Romans 6 is the scripture that says believers are dead to sin and alive in God. I want you to have a look at Hebrews, Hebrews 9 and 10. It's too long chapter, so I'm just going to tell you what it tells you. Hebrews 9 tells you about the old way of uh, sacrifice and offerings, right? When, when people sinned, they had to take calves and goats and doves, and they had to take it to the high priest, and the high priest would go and make a sin offering every year, um, and they would have to clean every everything with the blood because everything um, had to be purified. And, um, and, and chapter 10 tells you that we haven't been redeemed by the blood of bulls and by the blood of lambs and by the blood of goats, but we have been redeemed by the blood of God himself, right? Life is in the blood, okay? Life is in the blood. So what is sin, right? People think like we started baptism and, and uh, we, we, we have a uh, thought that says sin is what we do, okay? I, I want you to, um, uh, you know, Isaiah says, we have all fallen short. We have all gone astray like sheep. Not one of us has, uh, is, is uh, uh, without sin, every single one of us. So what, what is sin? Um, James 4.17 says, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. 
So it's not just what you don't, but what you do that is sin. If you know you have to do something and you don't do it, that is also sin. You get what I'm saying? You know you should be putting something in the right place. You know you should be doing something when you see the need. You know you should be doing those things, but it's not convenient at this time. But I have a whole list of other things to do. So that is also sin. Okay? Missing the mark is sin. Not doing what we're supposed to do is sin. And that is all sin. See, it's, it's, like, it's like, have you ever had, you know, in your, um, when you drive your car and you look at your side mirrors, if you look at your side mirrors, um, uh, Andy, has this, Andy had this, right, for a long time. There were cobwebs that were appearing on her side mirrors. And, and, and Andy, if you ever speak to Andy, she hates spiders, hates, hates, detests spiders. So every time she'll say, I keep breaking that cobweb, but he keeps making it every day. And I tell her, Andy, that doesn't look like in yesterday's cobweb. That looks like it's been there. She says, no, mom, I seriously broke the cobweb, and he keeps doing it ferociously. He just weaves this web every time. Yeah, that's what sin is like, okay? So... It keeps weaving, it keeps weaving, and the secret is that you kill the spider. You don't keep killing the webs, right? Not that you can kill the webs, but you can't remove the webs. You have to kill the spider, right? Sin is like that. You can't stomp on it. You can't pretend it's not there. You can't, you can't deal with removing sin. Sin had to be crucified. Sin had to die. There was no other way to it. There was no other way you could deal with it. And this is why every sin that you have ever committed, that you will ever commit, that you are committing, has been nailed to the cross of Jesus. And that happened how many years ago? And yet it took every sin. And I know I'm going to sound really ridiculous this morning, but I really want you to get, uh, think about it. I want you to think about it, right? It's like this. It's like, you know, you know when um, Ro um, Paul went to Rome and, they, and when, when they were so convicted, they brought all their occult books and they started burning it. And it was like 50 dirhams worth, 50 denarii worth of stuff. And that's like a day's wage, one, one uh, denarii is a day's wage. So th that was so much that they burnt it. But they couldn't get rid of it as long as somebody kept manufacturing. It's like, say, we want to have, we're saying Australia is going to have no alcohol. Okay, it's going to wipe away all alcohol. We're going to have a no alcohol policy. So we're going to have this booze party where you bring all your booze. We're not going to drink it. We're going to crack the bottles and we're going to thrash all the bottles and destroy all the bottles. As long as there is some place where it's producing the alcohol, however many times you break your bottles, somebody is going to be producing that alcohol. Do you understand? Sin is like that. If the man does not die, the sin will keep going. And I love the book of Romans. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it not once, a hundred times, because it is an amazing book. In the book of Romans, sin is referred to about 49 times. 48 of the times, sin is refer in the Greek is referred, it is a noun. Do you know what a noun is? A person, place, or thing. I remember my mom brainwashing us with this when we were little. It is a thing person or place. A noun is a person. So the sin he is referring to is a person, is your spirit which was sin, okay? It is usually you think of sin as an adjective, which is a doing word. It is not. It is not. It is a person in Romans that he refers to. So, you know, the Bible says that we are freed from sin. Does, it, does this mean that we don't sin anymore? Right? Does this mean that we're sin anymore? You see, um, Paul, I love this scripture in Paul, and you would have uh, referred to it many times. In Romans 7.15, he says, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For, I, uh, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I don't want to do is the thing I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I, but the sin that is living in me. Paul says this. Okay? So then what is it? If the scriptures say that we are dead to sin, why do we keep sinning? Okay? Pastor Sam looked at it last week and said, if you are saint, and why are you living the same, she said, right? So if, you are, uh, if, you, if your sin is dead, it is nailed to the cross, okay? Because remember in Genesis, God said to Adam and Eve, if you should eat of this fruit, you will surely die, Okay? They lived over 900 years after God said that. Did they not? Do you know what sin is? Sin 
is the separation of the spirit man from God. Okay? That is what happened with Adam and Eve, and we inherited it. You say, I didn't do anything. I was just born with it. No. This is why Jesus says you have to be born again. This is why he says you have to be born again. Because we were born with this sin nature, separated from God. Our spirit was separated from God. Okay? Are you, are you tracking with me? Our spirit was separated from God. And the only way that we could have life and that we could be united to God and with God is when we identify ourselves in the cross, we died with him. This is what, this is what baptism is. We identify ourselves uh, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. You see? Do you see? This is why Jesus says you must be born again. You must be born again so that your spirit is reunited with God's spirit. Okay? So, you know, this is a powerful scripture and I really want you to understand this. In Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3 verses, it says, when you didn't know him, you walked in, in disobedience and you were under the influence of the prince of the air. Okay? So if you are not connected to God and if your spirit is not in God, you are connected to something else and you are under the influence of the evil one. Do you understand this? So when you, were, when you thought you were not even being disobedient, when you didn't know God, you were already under the influence of Satan, under the influence of the evil one. Do you see? And when you come to him, he redeems you. He takes you from one, from the kingdom of darkness and transports you and transplants you in the kingdom of light. He gives you the mind of Jesus Christ. He makes you righteous. He makes you redeemed. He calls you saint. But we have a soul, which is our will and our emotions, right? This is why God says, be ye transformed with the renewing of the mind. And the way that happens is through the word of God. If we don't read the word and if we don't know the word, we can't be renewed in our mind. And so we have our old way of thinking, yes, I'm a sinner saved by grace. We will sing this forever. Sinner saved by grace. Yes, you committed adultery. It has been cleaned, washed, finished. But because you don't deal with the thinking, you're still walking around in the shame of the sin. Yes, you were sexually abused 30, 40, 50 years ago, but you are still walking ashamed. You are still walking uh, victimized by what happened because you haven't received it. You, your thinking hasn't changed. Do you understand? Wrong thinking is what produces our soul to walk in that. This is why Satan wants to, you, to keep you away from reading the word. Because it is the word that transforms your thinking. It is the word that tells you what your identity is. And he is telling you, you were dead. Yes. And there was no way you could keep breaking the cobwebs. Because that spider would keep coming back. And it had to be killed. Sin had to die. And it died in the name, in the blood, in the body of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so we are redeemed, completely redeemed, completely made new, completely made new. That's why the Bible says the old man is gone. The old is no more. It is not. He doesn't just give you a, he doesn't just take the stuff that pierced your heart. He gives you a brand new heart. He gives you a brand new heart because the old one stinketh. He gives you a brand new heart. But we don't realize it. You see, when a child is, this, we're learning this in baptism, it's really interesting. It's really um, mind-boggling to think that we were, we were born with a sin nature. You know, you don't teach a child to be selfish. The first thing they learn in the, in the sandpit is mine. They don't say, yours? You play? No, mine. You don't teach them that. You don't teach them to have a hissy fit when you don't pick them up. You don't teach them that, you know. When Andy was born, I would rock her to sleep and put her to sleep and she would just sleep. But when Georgia was born, Georgia was born in Australia. So the nurses told me, she's your baby. You don't have to worry about what everybody else thinks. If you want to hold her, you can hold her. And I held her and every time I put her down, she just screamed. And so I had to have her strapped all the time to me on one of those little carry thingies. And even when I was 
put, putting clothes to dry, I had to have her like this because she had gotten so used to the warmth of my body and she would just scream if I put her down. You don't teach them that. They learn. If I cry, I'm going to get the reaction I want, so I'm going to cry. So we have been programmed to think in a certain way. You know, we have learned so many things. Your temper, your his they are not genetics. This is nothing to do with your hormones. This is nothing to do with your grandfather's temper that has been passed down by your blood. No! What rubbish! Revelation, you are made new in him. You have a brand new spirit. The mind of Jesus is in you. As he is, you are. As he is. You know, sometimes we go through life thinking on one shoulder we have uh, the demon speaking and on one shoulder we have an angel speaking. And if we do good and if the good outweighs the bad, we are still a good person. But, um, you know, we have a dual nature. We come to Jesus, but we have a dual nature. So all Christians are schizophrenic. What nonsense? Who believes this stuff? No. He gave you the mind of Jesus Christ. The same power that resurrected him from the grave is in you so that you can transform your mind by the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says you are righteous. He says you are holy. You are not to be identified with your sin that he wiped away and nailed to the cross, washed by his blood. You are made new, saint. You are made new. Yes, you were dead, but you are made alive. You are made alive. No longer everything that had transformed your thinking from the, what had been told um, uh, in, in school, by your parents, by your siblings, by your friends, no longer. That is not your identity. Your identity is in him, made alive in him, transformed in him by his blood. You are not transformed because a bull was offered up for you. It was the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It was the bl blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Read Ephesians, it's a good one. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 6 says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit of work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following our passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. But, but, it is not the same now. But God has made you new. I heard this really um, interesting story about St. Augustine. He was walking down the streets one day and, and, and a lady he used to know intimately called out to him and said, Augustine, Augustine. And he turned around and he recognized the woman and he looked at her blankly and she said, don't you recognize me? And he said, I do, but the man who used to visit you isn't here anymore. Isn't that powerful? Have you heard of Kenneth Hagin? powerful man of God. He was known to pick locks as a child. There was not a lock he couldn't pick, it seems. Okay? He was really good at picking a lock. You know what it means to pick a lock, yeah? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So he used to be able to pick locks. So he got into the wrong crowd and they would pick locks and uh, 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 went into robberies and all kinds of things. And then he got saved. Okay? And then they called him and he said, Kenneth, we need you to pick a lock. And then he said he just couldn't pick the lock. He didn't have a recollection of how to pick the lock. It was gone. You see, the old is completely gone. But we live like, oh, it's my old sin nature. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. No, you are redeemed. It is no longer your identity. Walk in the new identity he has given you. There is, you know, look. If you put one good apple into a whole basket of rotten apples, your rotten apples are not going to turn good. Yeah? If you put one person who is sick in a room of who, uh, who, is uh, who, who are healthy, I'm, I can't be in the wrong spot. I, I got it on my forehead? No. Why didn't you say something? Terrible family. The world, because it's a fallen world, it's a broken world, sin has entered into it. The natural inclination is to do sin, is 
towards sin, not towards holiness. You can see that in a child. You put a pair, pair plate of lollies, you put a plate of broccoli. They're going to say, oh, broccoli. No. We are not inclined to do good. We are not inclined to do holy things. We are not inclined to be good. We have a natural propensity towards evil. That's just the, the sinful nature. But you see, when God says in that scripture, be ye transformed by the renewing of the spirit, that word transformed is actually the word metamorphosis. Okay? Metamorphosis. That's what happens when a, 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 a caterpillar uh, comes out of a cocoon, co no, cocoon, not a cocoon, a cocoon and becomes a butterfly. Okay? Metamorphosis. The butterfly... The bu the butterfly cannot go back into the cocoon, cannot turn back into a caterpillar. So what God does is metamorphosis. He takes his word and completely transforms the old. But the soul has a nature to sin. So the soul will want to do the old because it has been programmed. Yes, you're not going to get your own way. Yes, if you scream louder, they are going to uh, you know, completely be subdued. So you scream now. It's not, it's not genetics. It's, it's not hormone imbalance, really. It's because you haven't been transformed. So I lost my temper a couple of days ago because Georgia said she couldn't cut my hair. And I was like, it's a conscientious thing to think I'm not going to react like that. I used to scream every time I didn't get my way. I used to scream when I didn't think things were going my way and, and, and it wasn't what I expected. But I am not the old anymore. And I have to keep remembering the old is gone and the new is here. I don't have to react the same way I reacted. That is why, you know, the joy of God. So if God's spirit dwells in me because my old spirit is completely dead and his spirit is in me, then I must bear the fruit of the one that lives in me. The fruit of the Spirit is patience, goodness, peace, joy, right? We say that the old is dead, but every morning we are resurrecting the old. It's dead till your spouse comes home, and then it's resurrected again. <laughs> it's dead till your children come through the door, and the old man is resurrected again. No, it is dead. Dead don't walk, dead don't talk, dead don't do life. So you need to know the dead from the living. You are alive in him, made alive through him, in him, for his good works. The old is gone, completely gone. So don't tell me, I used to, man, I used to. Yes, that was gone. It's gone. It's gone. Be renewed, be ye transformed by his word, knowing your identity, knowing that he purchased you with his blood, completely redeemed you, and be born again, born again, identifying yourself with his death, his crucifixion. You who have died in him, have been buried in him, and now is resurrected, and just as he is seated at the right hand of the Father, so are we. We don't even understand. We don't even understand what it means to have the same power that resurrected Jesus living in us. We don't walk like that. We don't talk like that. We definitely don't. See, that is why we need to pray and read the word because our prayer is the word we read. Do you realize when you start to pray, when you first become a Christian, when you start to pray, your prayers are very different. It's like, Lord, you know, it's like, it's like you're just talking out of, like, you know, I, I had a bad day at school today. You know, my dog is being naughty. I hear, I hear these, the sweetest prayers from people who are learning to pray. It is so sweet. But then you come to read his word, and you know it's his word that is established in the heavens. And your prayer becomes his word. And you are praying his word. And I tell you something, there is so much power in it. Before you finish praying, you are seeing results to prayer. Church, honestly, you are hearing such quickened results to prayer because it is not your word, it is his word. And his word doesn't just flow out of our mouths. It's something we do by reading his word, by meditating his word, by letting his word wash us and transform our minds. So we don't have to go with the inclinations we feel. We don't have to go with how I think, I feel, I want, I desire, I like. No. You see, it changes. 
it changes. Everything else will talk to you about behavior modification. And Pastor Sam talks about this all the time. You know, it tells you, you know, change your ways, change your ways, change your ways. But Christianity is so different because he gives you a new heart, right? He gives you a new heart. The old one was torn, it was no good. So he gives you a new heart. And out of the outflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. And as a man thinketh, so he is. So get your thinking right. So let's get our thinking right. No more the sinner trapped in the sin. No more the victim trapped in the, in, in, in the abuse. No more trapped in the past. Let's get our thinking right. Let's get our thinking right. The battlefield is in the mind. Let's get our thinking right. This is what he came to do, to renew our minds, to renew our minds. Do you know why many people don't like giving testimonies? Because it's shameful, because the past is shameful, because what they did was shameful. There is no shame at the cross. There is no shame because that old person is no more in you. So you don't have shame to say, yeah, this is why, you know, this is why um, alcohol, uh, alcohol, uh, uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, those things, you know, because you know, I, I didn't go as, as, as an alcoholic, but I, I've been there. But, you know, they get up and say, my name is this and I'm an alcoholic. Your identity is already taken. You know? You are redeemed. You have a new identity, a brand new spirit in you. Yes, we were dead. Yes, we were separated. Yes, we could not call out to him because our desires were not for him or of him. But you are made new, brand new, brand new. The old spider has been decommissioned. They cannot be come, come back again. The webs cannot form again because you have gotten um, rid of what was there. Romans 6, 3 is the scripture that says you are buried in Christ who died and you are raised in him. Um, Romans 6, 3 is very powerful. He says, he who has died is freed from sin. Freed, not free, it's freed. It has been done. It has been done. You just need to know. The scripture says, knowing, knowing this, you need to know. You need to know. If you don't know that you were purchased, if you don't know you were freed, you can live a slave all your life because you don't know that the price has been paid and you are completely freed. And this morning, as your identity has been changed from the time that you have come to know him, I pray that you will no longer just be the, the, the result or, 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 or everything else that has been spoken over you, that you will know your new identity. You are redeemed. You are chosen, you are holy, you are righteous, you are sent, you are new. This is who you are. This is who you are. And there is power in thoughts. In, there is power in words. You know, I, I love how God keeps it so simple, but we just don't. You know, he gives us, like, he gives us things like absolute no-brainers. He says, this day I set before you life and death. Choose life. And, and we don't. Exactly. <laughs> Even a child understands. He says, choose life. Choose to speak life. And this is life. This is not just some book put together by some author. It's God breathed. God breathed. 66 books that have come together by 40 different authors that are constantly confirming everything. Constantly. It is scripture that is God-breathed for our instruction, for our transformation, for our sanctification. But if it sits on the shelf and you're only reading Psalm 27 and 91, there's not a lot of transforming happening. Turn to Romans. Turn to Ephesians. Turn to the old. Turn to the new. Everything. Everything. There is power in his word to transform you. You can't go back to being caterpillar again. You spread your wings and you fly because this is the metamorphosis that he has created you for. This is what he has created you for. We sang this morning, I am who you say I am. It's easy to sing. 
But then you say, my mother said, I will never be mounted or anything. On Sunday we sing, I am who you say I am. On Tuesday you say something completely different. Don't resurrect the old anymore. Don't resurrect the old anymore. Let the dead be gone. You can't take, you know, you can't bring dead things and keep it in your house. It's not pretty. Neither is the old version of you. Not pretty. Stink up. Leave it. Don't go there. Romans 6, 9 says, death no longer is master over you. Death no longer is master over you. What you have learned, your anger, your tantrums, your hissy fits, your bad moods, you've learned all of this. So don't think that when you just come to Jesus in a day, all of what you have learned is going to change in a day. You know, I, I, I love uh, the, the scenario that Pastor Sam said, you know, you don't walk through the door of Christianity and, you know, Matthew, you know, are you guys hooked on the chosen? I am, I love it. You know, Matthew didn't come from his tax collector uh, days and, you know, completely get changed in a day. I love a conversation that Mary Magdalene has with uh, another lady that was following Jesus. Uh, and <clears throat> and you know, she's, she's, they, they, they don't get along very well. And uh, she says, um, I met him in a bar, suicidal, drunk. You met him when he looked at you, lowering the, person, the paralytic, where he looked at you and he said, your faith is beautiful. They were following Jesus. They were walking with Jesus. But they had envy about how they even came to Jesus. Do you see? I love the humanness of it. You know, everything we have learned for 20, 30, 40 years don't just change just because you come and you become a Christian. You have your old ways of thinking. You have your old ways of speaking. You have your old ways of reacting. You have your old moods. You have all of that. And it doesn't just go away in a day. But what changes is the more you look to him, the more time you spend in his word, the more he washes you in his word, the old gets washed, 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 washed. Because remember, your spirit is made alive in him. Your spirit is new in him. He dwells in your spirit. God himself dwells in your spirit. So now you can start making your thoughts come right. You can start making your talk come right. As a man thinketh, so he is. So he is. And this is why there is no more room for the dead in the living. Okay? The dead and the living don't go hand in hand. The dead is gone and the living is here. And Jesus Christ himself gave his life so you can have life and life more abundantly. Amen? Let's close our eyes. Bow our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we come to you creating us a new heart, creating us in a clean heart so that we may understand what you have just spoken through your word, that we are no longer sinners but saints, that we are no longer lost in our dead identity but redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that we are the righteousness of the precious Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been transported, transplanted from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and our identity is who you say we are are and we thank you for this Lord we thank you that we don't identify ourselves in our sin no longer that we identify ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ himself and Lord let there be fruit let there be fruit let patience peace joy love long suffering all of that just come forth from us if anything is blocking our hearts from bearing this fruit Lord bring revelation bring conviction let your breath of life be over us this morning let your breath breathe into our soul, our spirit, our minds, our bodies, our flesh. Let your breath, let your breath, Holy Spirit, transform. Let your word transform. Let your breath make new. Let us know, Lord, beyond a doubt, beyond a doubt that we are not just sinners saved by grace, but we are your holy anointed people, a peculiar generation a holy priesthood set apart for your holy work, creating us, O oh Lord, a heart that knows our identity in you, our identity in you, O oh Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise, for you are the one who has called us by name. You are the one who changes us day by day. Father, 
let us gaze into your eyes. You said, O oh Lord, you keep in perfect peace whose mind stays on you. So Father, let our minds rest on you. Keep our minds on you so that we stay in perfect peace. We have prayed in the one whose words bring life. Lord, we thank you. We glorify you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.